Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Namaste experience. I see a lot of new faces. I see a lot of new faces. It's so good to see and to feel and to know all of you, to really know all of you. Not just to think I know, but to know at the deepest part that we have been pulled together here in this moment to do something that has never been done before. Well, that's not true. <laughs> Because it's always being done. It's always over. It was over before you even made the decision to see if it was possible to do something other than. Because the idea that you could do something other than what has already been done was the, the little glitch that caught us and, and interrupted that divine flow of awareness. In fact, the truth is, you, there's one thing that each and every single one of us is really good at. We're completely adept at. And it's only when we realize just how good we are at this one thing, this is where it all begins to fall into place. So here you are. This is the one thing that you are so completely adept at. Denying who you really are. <laughs> That's not fun to realize. Oh, maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> It might be, because when you realize that, when you see this through your real eyes, this is where you can begin to turn around. Until then, you're just going to keep cruising through the world of illusions, thinking that there's something to accomplish, something to do, something to get, whatever it may be. But the instant you, you just step back and realize, oh my goodness, the thing I'm best at is denying who I really am. Not with any sense of guilt, because your denial has had no effect. Your denial of who you are hasn't changed anything. It's just interrupted your vision of that which could never change. So, here's the thing though. If you were to claim resolute, absolute power, the power of your decision to achieve the impossible, and you use that absolute energy and power, that you have, then you would instantly remember heaven. Instantly. And you would remember that leaving heaven or your original state of wholeness is a complete impossibility. You would remember that leaving heaven is completely impossible. But it begins with the recognition that you've done a very good job at denying that. And you don't want to do it anymore because it hasn't given you what you really want. Now, so often in, in this denial, it's very interesting because we can take the, the reality and the truth that has been given to us and, and we can say the exact opposite of that and convince ourselves of the absolute truth of that which we just said. Did you hear that? I'm not sure I did, so let me say it again. <laughs> we can take what we just heard, if it's the absolute truth that I am one with God, there's nothing I can do to interrupt that divine flow. And, and I can take that reality, that truth as it's expressed to me, and I can immediately spin it around to, to mean the exact opposite and believe that that was the original intention of that which was shared with me. Okay? Let me give you an example. We often call this uh, the gospel of prosperity. Have you heard about this? Oh, yeah. oh probably. It's very big in, in certain Christian circles. The idea that, that the, the, the message of Jesus over and over is for you to be prosperous, abundant, and to make lots of money. That's what Jesus called you to. And, and they will find examples and evidence to support that idea. And they will preach it. And of course, people come flocking because that's what they really want to hear. It reminds me of that cartoon that we've mentioned many times here. Uh, that one, that one uh, square cartoon where there are two doors. The one that says heaven, the one that says workshop on heaven. There's a great big line... <laughs> great big line of people in front of the workshop and nobody standing in front of the door that says heaven. It's much easier to talk, to debate, to, 
to, to think about, oh, what, what can, and, and what we do then is we spin it around and, and we, we make it mean the exact opposite of, of what it was intended to be. Because as we know, if we want to look at the, the message of Jesus 2,000 years ago, it had nothing to do with gaining more goods, but sharing more goodness. In fact, it had to do with releasing and letting go of everything that you think you need. All of the possessions, all of the security that you think you need to be fulfilled, to be happy. Letting it all go and finding that source of all happiness that has never changed. Your inherent wholeness, which as we said before, if you were to harness the energy of that even for an instant, you would flash out. You would have no further need to be here if you harness the energy of that one experience that I am as God created me. And if I remain as God created me, guess what? Fear has no meaning. Evil is not real. Misery, sin, and death do not exist. That's it. That's why we claim how simple this is when we allow it to be. But until then, we're going to spin it around and try and make it mean something that it doesn't. The prosperity gospel is just one example. But as always, I have a story to tell you. Because as we know, we learn best through parables. So this is one that I just wrote yesterday because I was thinking a lot about this. Um, a few of you came to the church service over at St. Andrew's yesterday, which was nice. And, and this became very apparent to me, so I, I sat and wrote this down. An argument rushed through the ashram like a flood. And all the mother's disciples found themselves pulled in, forcing them to take sides. It was assumed that the mother was unaware of this discussion, though a few of the disciples knew that she was always fully aware of every subtle shift that took place. I'm convinced that the mother's message is for us to prosper and become financially abundant, a man who had only lived in the ashram for a number of months said. Why else would she encourage us to open ourselves to the divine and fully receive the universe's abundant flow of goodness? Another disciple, whose name was Mara, where's Mara? There you are. <laughs> disagreed, saying, If you had been here longer, you'd realize that Mother's true message is one of renunciation, not accumulation. She asks us to surrender everything to the altar of love. For in truth, love is our divine provider. The argument had been swirling for days, each side sure of its eventual victory. Finally, one night, when satsang began, Mother addressed the issue and said, If you take what I say and spin it to your own gain, then you slap me in the face. Everyone in the room gasped at this. But before anyone could say anything, Mother continued saying, Actually, it would be better to say that you slap the truth in the face, for this is our only true goal, to realize and activate the truth in every word we speak, in every action we take. Wouldn't you agree? Of course, everyone in the room nodded their head in agreement. Then why do you argue at all, she asks. Isn't the argument the opposite of the truth I share? Isn't the actual argument the opposite of the truth I share? Here, let me tell you a story that may help you understand, and through understanding put an end to this silly argument. Once, in a bustling city nestled between mountains, there lived a wise old man renowned for his profound insights and gentle demeanor. One day, a young traveler eager to learn from the sage approached him and asked, what is the secret to happiness and fulfillment? 
The old man sw smiled warmly and beckoned the traveler to follow him on a walk to a nearby river. As they strolled along the serene banks, the old man suddenly stopped and pointed to the water. Do you see those two sw fish swimming against the current? He asked. The traveler peered into the crystal clear water and indeed spotted two fish struggling against the swift flow of the river. Yes, I see them, he replied. The old man nodded knowingly. Watch closely, he said. As they observed, the two fish continued their arduous journey, battling the relentless current. However, no matter how hard they fought, they seemed to make little progress. After a while, the old man turned to the traveler and asked, what do you think those fish are doing? The traveler pondered this for a moment before responding. It seems they're trying to swim upstream against the flow of the mighty river. The wise old man smiled again. Indeed they are, he said. But tell me, are they finding any peace or contentment in their struggle? The traveler shook his head. No, it appears quite the opposite. They seem exhausted and frustrated. Any of you relate to that? How many of you feel exhausted and frustrated trying to swim the wrong way up the river? Exactly, the old man affirmed. You see, my dear traveler, life is very much like this river. There will always be currents pulling us in different directions, challenges to overcome, and obstacles to navigate. But true happiness and fulfillment lie not in resisting the flow of life, but in embracing it with grace and surrendering to its natural rhythm. Let me read that one more time. There will always be currents pulling us in different directions, challenges to overcome, and obstacles to navigate. That will always be true. But true happiness and fulfillment lie not in resisting the flow of life, but in embracing it with grace and surrendering to the natural rhythm. The traveler nodded, understanding dawning in his eyes. So the secret to happiness is to let go of resistance and trust in the inherent wisdom of life. Indeed, the old man confirmed with a wise smile. When we learn to surrender to the flow of life, we discover that everything we need is already provided for us. Just as the river nourishes the fish and guides them on their journey, so too does the universe provide for us when we trust in its divine wisdom. With this newfound understanding, the traveler thanked the wise old man and continued on his journey, carrying with him the timeless wisdom of surrender and acceptance. And as he ventured forth, he found that in, in embracing the flow of life, he discovered a profound sense of peace and contentment that filled his heart with boundless joy. The mother smiled and looked back at her disciples. It doesn't matter who is right and who is wrong, for in reality, there is no wrong. Only the eternal flow of grace that moves between us. But there are many ways that we deceive and slow our progress. And this is what I'm calling you to be attentive to. Claiming you are rich at the expense of one who, or right at the expense of one who is wrong, makes you wrong. Do you see this? Cling only to the one that is never wrong. The one that is never wrong. Cling only to the one who is forever, who is never wrong, but forever right. Then you will see, not with your eyes, but with your whole mind, that there is an open field beyond all of these ideas. As my dear brother Rumi once said, I'll meet you there. that field beyond all ideas of right doing and wrong doing. It's right there, right in front of us. You're standing in that field right now. All you have to do is to open up your eyes and see. 
but we become once again very adept at doing the exact opposite. And yet the moment has come. Here we are. There are no more excuses. Every idea or every excuse that we've made to keep swimming the wrong way up that current against that river has evaporated. And as you let go of them all, what happens? The natural current just takes you. I've mentioned before that I used to live in a floating house on the Columbia River, and I, I had a, a paddle board that I would love to get on, and I would, for about a half hour, it was good exercise, I would paddle against the, the current. And it took a lot of energy, but I would get a good half mile or so up the river, and then I would stop. And I would just let the current take me. And it would just pull the paddleboard in the right direction. And I would just sit there and be pulled all the way home. So that's the question now. How willing are you to be pulled all the way home? That's all it takes is your willingness and your desire that that's the only thing you want. To remember who you really are, who you've always been, who you couldn't stop being at any time, at any place, your desire to remember that you are one with God, that you are still as God created you. So, there you have it. Let's hear what Victoria has to say about this. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning, Brother James. Good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Um, well, first it makes me, <laughs> I loved. I love the parable. And it brought up uh, another parable that Prem, who's in this room, sent out a week or so ago that always makes me laugh because it's simple and it's true. And in this little parable, he has a cartoon. And in the cartoon, a student asks the sage, the wise man, again, what is the secret to eternal happiness? I hope Prem's in the room now. And the sage looks at him and says, oh, he says, the simple secret is I never argue with a fool. Oh. <laughs> the student says, oh, I disagree. I disagree. All oh, the sage says, you are right. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are right, is what he says. And it is the secret of resistance and non-resistance. And what we do in the world, when we identify with our own thinking, we use our eyes, our physical eyes, and we look outside of ourselves. And that's why some people seem to be rich and some people seem to be poor. And that's why many of those congregations that teach prosperity can gather many in because the desire is to be comfortable in the world. And when we look outside of ourselves, we see witnesses. Oh, this person, you know, prays, loves God, and look at how rich they are. This person does seem to pray, but they don't seem to be doing as well, but they're happy. And the secret is never to compare and look outside of yourselves, because the wonders of grace are always flowing, and they're always fulfilling us, always, if we recognize what the riches are. It's by recognizing, by so first of all, not resisting in itself is a luxury when we've been used to the thinking mind that tortures itself with judgment. So just relaxing and letting everything be, no matter the circumstance, that in itself is a luxury, it's a gift. So when we learn to rest and allow, things come and things go. But the things that come and go never uh, let us waver in our faith if we keep our eyes single to our heart, to the love that we are. If we realize that life is love and that love is a grace that's constantly flowing and we look inside instead of compare and try to get anything on the outside or judge, I'm not doing it right, I could be doing it better. The thing isn't to be doing it at all. The thing isn't do it right or wrong, it's to be receptive. Let me be open, let me be willing, let me receive. And in true receptivity, when we allow grace to fill us, fill whatever it is, however our lifestyle seems to be, it doesn't just fulfill us. It's naturally also giving of itself without our thought and effort. 
it becomes a natural, we become, like St. Francis says, let me be an instrument of peace, or not Francis, whoever wrote it. We become the instruments of that grace by receiving it with an openness instead of judging it and trying to improve on it. So many of us have sought certain things and we've done novenas and prayed and done all kinds of mantras and done purifications and maybe things got better temporarily or try to visualize and get sicknesses and stuff to go away only to have something pop in the, you know on the side door when we just let everything be as it is and receive it and welcome it without naming it that's what judgment is. We put labels on it and then we decide, oh, I like this, I don't like this. If we let everything be, sicknesses, problems, relationships, let it be and use the eyes of the heart. The eyes of the heart are love. The eyes of the heart look and give love of themselves. When we do that, when we look with love, we let the grace of love, the flow, that current of life, Life is love. The flow of that current is a grace that fills us. And temporarily, it may look like one thing and another thing the next moment. But what it always will be is an inner experience of peace and contentment. It's a peace that passes all the thinking, understanding of the ego. And as we do that, that peace gives of itself. When Jesus said, my peace I give to you. That's the kind of peace that we emanate, that we vibrate when we stay centered in the heart of love, when we look with the eyes of love, when instead of running from what seems to be a problem, be receptive to it, whether it, whatever it might be, just welcome it. And we, we give each other example of that all the time in our lives. And we do it in the little things, or sometimes we do do it in the big things. The, the key is to be consistent in it, to keep that focus on being open to love all day long and letting it express in a smile, in holding your hand out to someone, letting it be, not looking for it to be bigger or different or grander or anything else. It's so subtly simple. That's why it is childlike, not childish, but childlike. And together, as we learn to play in this field of grace, we let things be childlike because we're not interrupting that flow. There's no resistance. As soon as we, as soon as we make a resistance or an exception or correct ourselves or someone else, rather than, oh, I must not have been receptive. Let me go back and be open. This is a self-correcting system. Grace is a wonderful system. It's so practical. It's so efficient. It naturally corrects everything if we naturally stay open and tuned to the heart of love in ourselves and in each other and in the greater environment. So I just have to tell you this. So I'm flying home. I went to a wedding over the weekend in Minneapolis and I'm coming home in the, and I'm at the airport yesterday morning. And in the airport, they have a television in every little room where you, you know, the area where you sit to board the plane. And usually they play you know, um, CNN or uh, NBC or some news streaming thing. Instead, I looked up and what are they playing? They're showing this program, not just a man, not a religious person, a person. And he's talking about secrets of happiness. And he's telling everyone his whole program is based on forgiveness. He's not preaching it from a pulpit, from a caller, not from any tradition, East or West. He's got this whole program on the joys and the powers of forgiveness. And I thought, oh my gosh, look at this. The world is awakening to love. Then I'm still sitting there, I'm early. The next thing is showing someone having a Japanese tea ceremony. Now it isn't just the Japanese tea ceremony they're all watching. What, they're, what that is a lead into meditation and pausing and resting and relaxing. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, who is streaming this? This is incredible. Love is everywhere if we look for it. And when we look for it, it starts showing up everywhere. So that's our job. Our job is to bring forth love, but we can't bring it forth if we don't receive it simply in the ordinary things all day long. 
Okay, Brother James, that's it. Thanks, everybody. I love you. I'm so glad to be back. I missed you Friday. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. Yes, we missed you as well. And I, I love this idea you shared of never argue with a fool. Thank you to Prem. And, and as I'm hearing that, I'm thinking that the number one fool I should never listen to is my own mind. The foolishness of my own mind. Is, is Prem out there? Prem, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Tell, tell us why that that quote touched you. Because it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and true. <laughs> I, I try to keep them laughing. You do very well at that. Thank you, Prem. <laughs> yeah, it thank true. you. It's hilarious and true. We are hilarious and true. You know, the, the silly games we play to try and hide, the, the hide-and-seek ridiculous game that we play, is is very interesting it's silly but the truth of who we are never changes that's all you need to do is to rely on that the truth within you never changes that's the ticket that's the ticket home so let's pull that in let's let that ring inside of us all day today and we say together amen amen amen, 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 amen and so it is. Have a beautiful day, everyone. We love you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. See you. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye now.